ladies and gentlemen, John Mahler is the Libertarian candidate for U.S. Congress to represent Utah's 4th Congressional District. John, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on, Adam. How are you doing today? Outstanding, outstanding. Although I got to say, I'm getting freaking tired of talking about <laughs> coronavirus. And right. I can't imagine as a candidate, because like I, I have so much respect for Ron Paul as a candidate and an activist, because you look back to him from the 80s, he was saying the same dang thing over and over and over again. And I get it. When I run for office, I better have a darn good reason. I better love what I got to say because you're going to say it over and over. But now you got to say, hi, do you want me to wear a mask or not? <laughs> over and over. Am I right? What are you, what's it, what's it like for you, John? It's uh, it's been interesting. I guess that's an easy way to put it. I mean, it's, it's been hard, but the nice thing is, you know, with all the changes of coronavirus, I mean, social media and technology allow it to still maintain that kind of flow. You just kind of have to adapt, overcome and improvise, just like how we learned in the military. So just one day at a time, all you can do. Well, I mean, give me a, well, I, I want to come back to this because I really want to get a sense of the texture of your campaign and how you're interacting people and how Corona is affecting you right now. Right. But yeah, why don't you start with the personal background and, and, and what makes you qualify to be a member of <laughs> Yeah, I got to love that question, especially because I'm under 30. So I do get that one a lot. So my background starts um, with the Army. That's when I was 17, graduated high school, went off to the Army. I was in the intelligence community, deployed to Iraq at 19. Um, so when you get into what your qualifications for Congress, a lot of what Congress does is dealing with the international issues. And I already have a background in dealing with that. When I was in the army and in Iraq, I had already dealt with preventing international incidents, um, maintaining strategic relationships with partners in Iraq and from other nations that were there operating alongside us. And then when I got out of the army in 2014, I went into a uh, culinary school because college was just boring at that time. Culinary school. Smart, in smart enough to avoid the racket and get a practical skill for something that you're passionate about that has the potential to be a career that you could love, right? Yeah, okay. exactly. And ended up not doing it really much as a career. It was out in San Diego. You didn't get paid a whole lot to do it. So I went into finance and uh, did some things for myself. And now we're running for Congress. So well, hold on. We see you got into finance. You didn't get a four-year degree, did you? No. <laughs> what, did you, what, what was that path? Uh, that path was just licensing. You find a sponsor, you get licensed, and you can go to work. Finance is one of those jobs where a degree is really just a resume point. So what when you say into finance, and it's pretty broad, give, give us yeah. what, what were you actually doing? So I was doing a little bit of financial planning um, for a little while, and then I ended up getting out of working for uh, with clients and things like that and ended up going into working for myself, doing investing in equities and real estate. And I was doing that until about November. I had a, night, a feeling that there was something going on with the stock market. It looked like there was a crash coming, so I pulled everything out. And look what happened with Corona a few months later. So, Were you able to buy the bottom? I didn't buy back in. I took my stuff. I'm still looking at this as, you know, we've had a bit of a bull run, but it looks like nothing more than a dead cat bounce to me. So I right. so I was, it'd, be, it'd be I, a risky time. It would You could have done it if you called it perfectly, but it would have been a risky time to jump in because you think it's going to come. It, yeah, obviously there's, there's a false front. to the, uh, one, of my, one of the best memes I've seen going around to explain this, they've got a picture of a house where there's been a been a house fire and it's completely burned out except for the facade of the house and it's got yeah. the, the the house of the inside is labeled the economy and the front mm -hmm. is the stock market and it's like yeah you could have got it in if, if you you know but it, it would have been it, it's it's risky it's still volatile well while right. we're on this and if, if it's an area of expertise like I, you know I'd, I'd like to ask you just out of, out of curiosity then your take on the current dynamics of the stock market versus the rest of the economy and you know what general advice you would give people i mean like you know give give, give us your overview and, and maybe your bullet points on you know if you're an individual in the culinary field out of work right now right there's a lot of people like that yeah um or if you're an investor or if you're retired you know how do you uh how do you respond to this uh, most effectively 
So for me, I have a lot of passive residual income, so I don't really have to worry about, you know, job changes as I'm going through this. I mean, I've took everything out of stocks and I'm looking at reinvesting into more agriculture and using that culinary background to try and bring some more rare and exotic foods to restaurants or individuals and even just feed my local community. I mean, I really got started into that just because with everything that happened with COVID, you know, we can prep with pantries and um, food items, water storage, guns and ammo, that's stuff I normally do, but living in a condo, um, I wasn't thinking about a garden. So when COVID kicked off, it was like, all right, the food shortages are coming. I knew that day one because, you know, coming from Iraq, you get to see some things on how when society just goes broke, <laughs> you kind of get an idea of what's coming next. So I went straight into the garden side and I've just been playing with that. And, um, you know, after the election, my wife and I are looking at getting a bigger property to go ahead and grow and expand into kind of like a market garden production to just supply at farmers markets, maybe some local restaurants, things like that. Nice. Nice. So in terms of the, someone unemployed right now, someone who's struggling though, like what would you, I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot, there's a lot yeah. of people right now. I mean, right. I, I wouldn't say I'm struggling. I'm, I'm very fortunate to be in, in a position, um, you know, similar to yours in that sense where, you know, at least I've got, I'm already, I own my property. I'm off grid. I'm, I'm, I could be self-sustaining, although not quite there practically yet. And, um, you know, I, I, still like i it it sucks man like every, everything's yeah. difficult but for people who are like facing evictions unemployed you know you, you, what, what would you tell someone in that situation i would say it's a tough one to get a handle on period because a lot of what we're dealing with really just comes down to every single day that the government says that you can't go back to work or we can't have this open you can't travel here is another day where people just aren't able to make money. So this is something new to a lot of us. We're dealing with stuff that's very similar to what we've seen with socialistic collapses in the past. So how do you survive that? We're not quite clear. I mean, you wanna take an example of like Cambodia with Pol Pot when he came through and took all the farms away and gave them to the rich people and put the rich people into, or put the rich people into the farms and the poor people into the cities. You know, we're seeing a bit of a wealth transfer, like we're seeing with Amazon, Walmart, and other things like that. Well, you know, Amazon being a prime example has had over a hundred percent stock increase through this Corona pandemic, just because of the fact that the government shut down all their competitors. So what do you tell somebody like that when they're going through this? I don't know, other than open everything up, because that really is what's keeping the people down because it's creating a false monopoly for those companies like Amazon, Walmart, and others that wouldn't exist if the government wasn't sponsoring it right now. Well, so I know, I know this is a bit of a tricky line for a congressional candidate, mm -hmm. but would you advocate for people in those circumstances to uh, go gray market, so to speak, to be to be working under the table, to be creating sort of off off books businesses and 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 create to to be defiant of. Uh, not just the coronavirus orders, but normal red tape? I mean, I would say at this point, you know, we're kind of all on survival basis and you got to do what you got to do. So, yes, <laughs> come on. Would, would you tell someone that, hey, well, can you, can, I mean, you're, you're running as a libertarian. Can you stand there with a straight face and say, no, follow the laws, let your kids starve? No. Let's say go to work. What are you gonna what are you gonna do? Have the cops come arrest you and go for going to work? Okay. I, are you just gonna lie there and roll over? You can't do that. So I mean as a candidate, don't really want to get in there saying, yeah, go break the law, but at the same time, when the government comes in and starts doing stuff like this, what else what else are you left with? You're not they're not giving you an option. Wait, you're not gonna be a follow the law candidate. If you're no. a follow the law candidate, you're like, hey. Elect me, and if I write something down, I'm going to say you better freaking do it, or I'm going to send cops after you. I'll say morality and legality are not the same thing. Nice. All right, so tell us about your platform, John. What motivates you? Like, what do you want to be a voice for in Congress? So I kind of got into politics just because of that fact that when I got out of the military, you know, I wasn't really liking the way the country was going. I didn't like the way the government was treating me. I wasn't liking the way things went. I was at a really close point to leaving the country for good. I was actually on my way out when I met my wife and, uh, you know, she was kind of like, okay, well, I'd actually like to stay. And it was okay. Well, we either got to stay and I'm going to run for politics to fix this stuff or we're leaving the country. So 
decided to stay and run. And uh, a lot of what I decided to run on was just based on talking to people and what I'm hearing in the news. There was a lot, a big common denominator that I found where we were talking about the economy, healthcare, whatever. Uh, there just seemed to be a disconnect between the politicians and the policies they were enacting and the consequences of those very same policies and how they affect people. Like you were talking earlier in this uh, show today about how, you know, politicians have laws that apply to us, but don't apply to them. And that's been one of the big ones that I try and take on. You know, the government's coming in and shutting down everybody's businesses. Meanwhile, they're still getting paid. Congress starting salary is $174,000 a year. Yet, so con yet you got those same people getting the paychecks while everybody else is losing out on theirs. It's trying to end those double standards is a big part of it. So Utah's fourth congressional district, what's your electorate like uh, and how have they been affected by this crisis? So the seat I'm running for used to be Mia Love's seat. Um, she was the one who was known for the seat. Now it's Ben McAdams. And uh, it doesn't really seem like our politicians, whether at Congress or in our state, have really been affected too much in and of themselves. But I mean, that's kind of what it is. They keep talking about Utah's, you know, not been hit so hard on unemployment compared to other states. And it does seem like Utah has been a lot better in a lot of cases, but we do still have our own issues that are going on. People still not getting their checks for the stimulus, um, still out unemployed, things like that, that are still ongoing and still being something that we're dealing with out here. Do you, like, I, what was the story of the shutdown in, in Utah so far? Did you go to like a full lockdown, shutdown, uh, masks in public, and, and where are you guys with that now? So it depends on the counties. Um, Utah has been very kind of mixed on it. You've got one side that's very big on pushing the masks. Um, Salt Lake County asked our governor for permission to do an executive order on allowing them to go ahead and push a mask mandate. And as far as I know, they're the only county in the state that has actually done that. So I haven't really been to Salt Lake County throughout the process since those mask mandates kicked off. My county is Utah County and we haven't had mask mandates. We do have a lot of our grocery stores that have just started adding in mask mandates to come into their stores, um, but that's about it. We don't really have big mask mandates or anything like that. We have had restaurants had to shut down, bars had to shut down. And the really weird one was the churches having to shut down because you've got Utah, which is usually seen as one of the most religious states with the Mormon church here, shutting down religious gatherings made absolutely no sense to me. That was a weird one for me because I'm an atheist myself, like one of the few atheists in Utah. And I'm one of the people out there going, no, people should be allowed to go to church. That's one of their <laughs> fundamental rights in this nation. Wow. So it's been weird. It's been wild. I mean. But in, so then I assume in, in terms of, so do you campaign with the mask? I mean, you go to events, you do, are there still events? Do you get to do canvassing or anything? Or is it all online? What's it like for you? So I shut down a lot of the um, in-person stuff, which is fine by me. I'm not a big fan of in-person interactions just because I do have some social anxiety. So the less I have to do of them, the better for me. So we switched everything to online. Um, I did a lot of stuff going heavy into YouTube when everything kicked off. I mean, I like to go hiking and fishing and do stuff like that. So I was like, all right, well, everybody's freaking out about Corona. And if you can't have some fun with a bad situation, it's going to drive you crazy. So and while everybody's sitting here at home wondering what the hell is going on and they have no clue what's going to happen, I'll just go out, even though I'm tech. I wasn't technically allowed to go to different county lines at the time. And I just go out, go hiking, show some videos like that, and then talk about politics while I was out there so that I could still communicate with people because that's one of the great things of modern technology is you can reach anybody anywhere, anytime without having to leave your house. But I could do it in a way that showed them what I was doing and talking about in a way that hopefully helped them feel a little bit more relaxed, a little bit more at ease and showed them, hey, maybe it's okay to actually go outside, not just be stuck in my house. We got mountains, we got lakes, we can still go out and play and have a good time. Hmm. Mm. So that's every, beautiful but it's it's sad that that's what's necessary now it's it's wild man this nation what we're going through this year man i just i don't even know what i fought in iraq for at this point <laughs> what was your iraq experience what did what, what uh mos when when did you deploy what did you do there so I was uh, in the Army. I was a 35 Mike human intelligence collector. I was there in 2010 to 2011 for a 12-month deployment. Um, and I was up in northern Iraq working a lot with the local populace, working with special forces, working with um, cavalry, infantry, different letter agencies, uh, working pretty much with anybody who was there. 
trying to help with strategic and tactical relationships with our government and foreign governments, trying to maintain those relationships and make sure that Iraq was a place that we could eventually hand off to the new regime and let them take care of it themselves. Um, so it was an interesting time, especially because of the fact that I was there right during the drawdown um, that Obama was pushing through. So yeah, <laughs> interesting would be an easy way to say it. You know, it's funny. That was even when I was there in 2004. That was a big part of the myth. Oh yeah, we're just getting it ready so we can give it back to them. We're just cleaning uh -huh. it up for them. Right. It's like that was 2004 Battle of Fallujah, and you're like, Yeah, exactly. We're still there. How many years later? Like, I don't know. Man. So how, <laughs> did, did that have something to do with motivating your activism or your candidacy? I mean. Yeah. How could it not? You know, you give up those years of your life to go fight for a country and fight for a cause that you believe in and come back and you're like, okay, well, everything that I just went and fought over there for and fought against, a lot of it we're doing here. I mean, like a big point that I keep pushing through the campaign with what's going on this year is the police brutality stuff, because we see the way that the cops are acting towards citizens. And if it was in Iraq or Afghanistan, you'd be facing UCMJ for doing that stuff. Well, I don't know about that. I don't know. I think I think my point would on, on that issue would be like if you look at how the occupying U.S. military forces treated civilians in Iraq and Afghanistan with a, with an escalated level of brutality, right? You you know you you would have a violent revolt on your hands, like we're starting to get here. Yeah. And I mean, you had issues in Iraq that in Afghanistan that were bad and got the media attention and got blasted like crazy. And even our own U.S. government was down to blast those. But for some reason, when it's whenever it's the police doing it against our own American citizens, dead silence. You still have qualified immunity. You still have militarized police. Nothing's changed. Meanwhile, when stuff happens in the military, all of a sudden you've got massive PowerPoints and retraining and everything else going on. I mean... That's how it was when I was in. It might probably was a little bit different in 2004 with the stuff going on. But I mean, 2010, win hearts and minds. Don't you dare hurt what we're trying to do over here. So, yeah, I guess that was one significant shift is that they had kind of locked down the the bad PR side of the brutality over there by the time you got there. Mm -hmm. What is that? What what of that leads you to believe that? You know, you as a member of Congress can have a positive impact on foreign policy. Um, having actually dealt with it before, you know, having to actually try and work to develop and maintain those relationships. Those are things that a lot of people just can't do sometimes because of cultural differences. They don't understand. It's really hard to try and communicate and learn how to get along with people that you maybe don't speak the same language with or humor is a big way that we bond with people that you know when you don't speak the same language it's really hard to things don't translate so being able to understand how those types of things can be worked around to try and help build and maintain those relationships mm -hmm. definitely helps um, also having come from a background of you know having been in a war to know what it's like so that you're not as quick to jump into one i think definitely helps like the candidate i'm running against uh ben mcadams not a veteran never seen a war zone we just had a vote on if we should withdraw from Afghanistan and he voted to keep us in Afghanistan. Whereas I would have been the guy going, no, I've been to a war zone. I've seen what these are like. I know what's going on in Iraq and Afghanistan. Get us out. We're wasting our time. Mm. Why do you think someone like that, what, what are they missing? Is it they don't care? They're willing to vote for the, the will of the military industrial complex? Don't or care. Is, it genuine, is, it, is there some genuine pro-war ideology behind this guy? I think it could be a mix of any of it. I mean, there's not really a way to tell exactly why somebody thinks that way. But one thing is clear is that if you haven't seen a war zone, you really don't know what it's like. And it's going to be easy to make kind of a different assumption than what somebody who has seen it can come in and say no from personal experience. Because um, war is just one of those things. If you haven't lived through it, there's no way to understand it. All right, let me let me ask the question another way. That was great. Don't get me wrong. Okay. 
Because when you look at a politician who votes with the military industrial complex, you go, this guy could be entirely genuine. He could be selected, not an infiltrator, just the, the military industrial complex got money to the campaigns of the people who are the most pro-military naturally, and that he, he actually believes it. So whether you're not whether you believe him or not, there is still a, a big enough portion of your constituency mm. that says, well, we got to kill them over there so they don't kill us over here. Or we got to fight them over there so we're, we don't get terrorist attacks over here. And they, they really, they, their worldview really is, is based on either some delusion, misunderstanding, or just inhumane, racist devaluation of Arab lives. What do you say to that part of your constituency? I haven't really seen that in my constituency, honestly. Like, we have a really big military community in Utah. Um, and so a lot, you know, the military is one of the big pe groups of people that really wants to see us move away from those wars. Utah does have some problems with um, not quite liking people who are exactly the way that they envision some of the Mormons should look in Utah. But I mean, as far as, you know, those people are bad, we should kill them all over there. There's not really a whole lot from what I've seen. They have a very small minority. And so it's not really something I tend to address in general, other than, you know, whether we're talking about from a religious standpoint, you know, some of them get mad because Islam versus Christianity. And at that point, it's really, you know, if we, whether you're talking about Islam, Christianity, Buddhism, Hinduism, atheism, paganism, if we're not all free to practice our religions, then none of us are. And so that's usually good enough for the constituents that I've talked to anyways. That's beautiful, man. I'm glad that guy gives me hope. <laughs> right. You know, this, this is, and I suppose it is, it is worth pointing out, even in how I set up this question that, Military industrial complex money finding naturally pro military candidates means that they're the ones who are going to be able to just get their name ID up. And so that demographic is way overrepresented in Congress than it is in the rest of the country. And that's not just true about the military, that's true about your opinion on pharmaceuticals mm -hmm. and manufacturing I, I, and import export. And yeah, every other issue that anybody could profiteer off through government. So, John, yeah. I'm glad that we have. Sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, like, you're exactly right. You know, everything comes down to money in politics. And that's part of the problem is because it comes down to who has the most. And sometimes that's not the majority of people. Sometimes it's a very small minority. In fact, most times it's a minority. Because you look at just the population and, you know, you talk about 1% controlled all the wealth. Well, those 1% are the one people who are pushing the politics because they have the funding to make it happen. All right, John. Well, hey, uh, last question. What would you want to say to your fellow libertarians online about why your campaign is worth supporting? So big things that I'm pushing, like I said before, you know, I'm just trying to end that disconnect the politicians have between the consequences of their actions and the policies that those uh, have those consequences for the rest of us. So if you really want some changes to come through that will have a lasting impact and you want to try and help support me, I mean, I'm running on things like uh, cutting their salary down from that $174,000 a year that it's at right now down to the median household income of their voters minus the same unemployment rate so that they actually have a salary that represents the people they're representing, actually have to live in that economic stance the same way we do. You know, we're talking about veterans and healthcare being so horrible. It's a big topic right now with the U.S. Post Office and everything, but these Congress members don't really understand the VA. They have their gold care or gold standard health care, get rid of that, push them into the VA. I'm running on a platform that really is just about making sure that these politicians have immediate consequences for their actions so that I don't just come in and say, I've got really good ideas. This is what we're going to do. And then when I'm gone, everything falls apart. We're trying to make sure that there's actual consequences in place in a system that puts these people in check so that they come up with good ideas. And if they don't, and the, there's actual consequences that they immediately have to rectify that hurt themselves and put their necks on the line the same way that we all have to as well. Beautiful. John, thanks so much for joining us. The website is Molnar for the number four utah.home.blog anything else you want people to know or how to connect with you uh you can follow me on twitter or instagram is at gear six alpha facebook and youtube are molnar 2020 um you can follow me along on there if you can't donate i mean obviously always appreciate like comment subscribe type deal 
Um, but if you're in Utah or know people in Utah, definitely tell them to vote for Molnar to tell DC enough. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us, John. Thanks for having me, Adam. Appreciate it.